Hello everybody and welcome to our latest uh, Meet the World panel um, which is entitled Stitching Stories. I'm Sarah Bauer and I'm joined today by Jennifer Champion, Sally Ann Lomas and Mariko Nagai as well as our expert Ruth Battersby Took who is Curator of Costumes and Textiles for Norfolk County Council. Um, all the writers on this panel have been inspired in one way or another by the extraordinary embroidery work of Lorena Bulwer and I'm going to ask Ruth to start us off by introducing us to Lorena and her work and then after that each of the panellists will say something about their own work and the dialogue that they've had with Lorena and then we will um, go into a more general discussion of the relationship not just I think between the work that any of us have done and how it might relate to Lorena but more broadly what it is what the synergy and the spark is between needlework and writing because there does seem to be one and maybe we'll get to the bottom of that during the course of the afternoon so Ruth if I can ask you to um, give us an introduction to the wonderful Lorena thank you Yes, thank you for inviting me today to speak about uh, Lorena. I have um, been working with these embroideries now for 15 years um, and I've shown them to hundreds of people from all sorts of different backgrounds. So, you know, obviously writers, artists, makers, but also medical professionals and historians. Um, so it's, it's a real privilege to be able to share this, uh, this amazing story with a, a wider audience today. Um, so I'm just going to start uh, with a view of an installation of an exhibition, just because I wanted to give the works a little bit of human scale so that you can see what we're actually talking about here are stitched embroideries, which are in total all of the length of the work that is in our collections in Norfolk Museum Service um, is 6.6 .6 metres, and that's 21 uh, feet, seven inches worth of, of writing. Um, and there are 7,300 words um, that she has stitched into her work. So uh, Lorena Bulwer um, was actually born in 1838 in Beckles, um, part of a middle class family. Um, her father was a grocer and she would have learnt needlework um, as a young girl um, and certainly I think practised it all her life. Um, where we actually have any examples of her work is from where she enters into the workhouse, um, the Great Yarmouth workhouse, when she's actually in her late 50s and she was in the lunatic ward, as it was known, um, as a private patient. So she wasn't actually in a workhouse due to poverty um, and she had stayed all her life living with her mother um, who she was very uh, fond of and attached to um, until her mother died in 1893 and then we think by about 1896 she actually enters into into the workhouse and she makes these embroideries um, as a, a way of expressing her her anger at being in the workhouse um, and towards members of her family so um what we're seeing here in terms of the text is that she's actually using the text as a, as a sort of uh, formatted form. So she's actually using these block capitals in order to be able to be to be clear in what she's she's saying. Um, so we in our kind of digital age, we view this as as shouting almost, which is almost quite quite apt in a way um, for, for the message that she's actually getting across. But she also uses stitch to actually enclose letters in uh, words in cartouches. Um, and she also underlines words and she, she adds drop shadows to them to highlight them and make them appear more prominent. Um, and she changes the colour of the thread, which we'll see as some of the other images to, to show um, very clearly uh, what she's actually saying. So you've got this contrast between the background and the colour of the thread. So this is a reverse of one of the samplers, and I, th I think it's really useful to be able to, to think about them in terms of a, a construction. So they are actually um, patchworks. There's two layers of patchwork. There's the front and the back, um, and these are actually held together by the stitches themselves that make the words. So essentially, it's almost like a quilt um, in the way it's actually all held together. Um, and then she finishes off with binding around the edges. Now, so this, this creates a really sturdy and robust uh, form. Um, they're very strong um, and they are um, made with domestic techniques that she would have been practicing her, her entire life. So the other thing to note, I suppose, with the way they would have actually been made is that these layers of, of fabric are actually quite thick. So the act of forcing the needle through these layers of fabric may well have had a cathartic um, you know, expression as well as a verbal expression of the anger that she's, she's actually talking about. 
So this is the one that I suppose I've spent the most time with. This is the longest one, which is 12 foot long. Um, it's been in the collection since 2004. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, it's a familiar medium, the, the medium of, of a textile um, with a text on to her. She, she, uh, she worked as a domestic servant um, for her mother in a, in a boarding house, but she also was a milliner um, in 1861. We can see that on the census. So she, she's clearly skilled with her hands. Um, and I think this is also part of the reason why these have actually survived as, as objects, because um, the sheer skill in the endeavour the hours of labour that we can see evident in them um, meant that they have actually survived just because, you know, you're not going to throw something out of this way. Whereas if you'd found perhaps writing um, on paper, it would have been much more easy to sort of destroy or dis disregard it. So actually, this is a way of really making permanent her, her thoughts. So the text itself is um, a stream of consciousness. It's a free association of memories and recollections, accusations, gossip, assertions to her rights of, uh, to property and to freedom. Um, but there is no punctuation throughout it. So I have obviously spent quite a lot of time reading parts of the letters out um, and, you know, you become completely breathless. There's a, a relentless slew of words and thoughts um, coming at you. And then you have to sort of take yourself back and remember that what you're looking at is a stitched text. Um, so we've kind of experimented, obviously, with, with trying to, to follow her techniques to see how long it would have taken her. This is one of the frequently asked questions. Um, and we estimate it to be about 10 to 12 words in an hour. Um, there is a section on one of the samplers where she does mention contemporary dates um, and between the 5th and the 10th of a month, she's made 17 lines. So that's, that's probably about three a day, but we don't know quite how many hours she was uh, allowed to do that. So this kind of, it's slowed down, but actually the speed of the thoughts, you can really kind of get a sense of how fast they must have been running through her head. So um, I'm just going to show you a couple of excerpts from them. Um, I'm not going to read out the, the text itself. I'll just leave it up there and, and talk around it. Um, but just to have a look at some of the themes that come through. So clearly one of those very strong themes is that she should not be in the workhouse and she, she wants to leave. She doesn't belong with these people. Um, they are English tramps, hawkers, show people. Um, and she, she feels that she should not be in there. And as I said, she, she did have money, um, but... Uh, it, you know, the reasons why she's actually in the workhouse are probably more to do with um, the convenience of her siblings putting her somewhere close. Um, and then the other theme that really comes through is this, this business with her family um, and her anger towards certain members of her family. So the bottom piece of text here um, talks about her, her brother, her brother's wife's family um, and how they are a, you know, a bug lice and flea tribe, Cambridge's socialist den um, that, you know, should be pelted with rotten eggs. And this kind of expresses some of the extraordinary language and why, had they been written down, it probably would have been quite easy to actually destroy those because they are, you know, they make for a challenging read, some very challenging language in there. Um, and you can really sense the fury that she has towards, towards members in comparison with her blessed mother, Auntie Nancy, Tickles My Fancy, which is how she always describes her, her mother. And it's actually a rhyme uh, called Billy Boy um, that she's sort of quoting, which sounds like it might have been a nursery rhyme. Um, so you really get the sense of... Um, of relationships, um, relationships are good and bad. So um, I'm just showing the, these last two images here, um, which pick up on another couple of themes. Obviously, I mentioned she's in the, the lunatic ward um, and madness is a theme that runs through consistency consistently. It's not something that she ever reflects on about herself. It's much more to do with um, other people. So old mad Molly Hawes is mentioned several times throughout uh, the text. Um, and this is a really interesting piece here because um, you can actually really sense that she really remembers this event that she's talking about um, where, where Molly Hawes was taken to the Coney Hatch Asylum um, and how it has completely sort of stayed in her memory and this kind of almost eidetic, um, you know, very rich memory comes forward. And also you can see, again, some of the more unusual language um, in that she does use the, the terms eunuch and hermaphrodite um, throughout the text um, in addition to, to other kind of slurs towards people. And then the last one I wanted to just sort of pick up is um, the, the retrospective diagnosis that we have from medical professionals is that she was experiencing um, uh, schizophrenic disorder. Um, and 
This is something that's been picked up on because she, she talks about people being tricksters and imposters and, and not being quite what they appear to be. And this, this section here about her sister, Anna Maria Young, um, uh, wearing a false nose, false teeth, false hair, um, is, is really kind of uh, brings that very much to, to life. But it's, it's worth remembering um, that the enameled hands that she refers to is actually a contemporary reference to Madame Rachel, um, who is a, a beautician who was practicing um, enamelling was her was her service that she actually um, supplied so if we only ever read these texts through the lens of mental ill health we know that she was experiencing some delusions but that does not mean that everything she says is delusional um, and I think it's really important to to kind of listen to the primacy of the text and, and view them as, as historic documents so um, I'm really looking forward to hearing what everybody has been been creating in response to these words and it's always fascinating to um, to see different responses to, to the text that she's created. Thank you very much Ruth as sally Ann was saying that was fascinating and it, it told me a lot I didn't know. Um, there's one tiny thing which I picked up on, which is only really of general interest, but um, does everybody know what cosmetic enamelling was? You no. mentioned that. Um, oh, because I thought you would, it would maybe be able to explain it, but as I understand it, it was um, a kind of um, cosmetic treatment that could be done to make your skin look very smooth. Um, and it, it, do you know more about it than I do, Ruth? It's just sort of interesting. Yeah, so um, Madame Rachel was um, famous at the time in the sort of late Victorian period for, for offering a service called enamelling, which was essentially just fine sandpapering, really. So we'd maybe see microdermabrasion or something these days. Um, but it, what, what's really interesting is that if you don't know anything about, um, you know, late Victorian cosmetic treatments then you could read that section about enamelling and see that as her making her sister into some kind of a doll um, and read much more into it so actually it's you know it's more interesting to actually think well you know who was Madame Rachel what's going on there and to read it as a primary document um, and that can tell you I mean it's incredible to be able to listen to somebody's thoughts and to kind of get an insight into into what what she's reading as well because she must have been reading stories about Madame Rachel um, and and you know consuming popular um, literature at the same time yeah, reading the popular papers now that was really really interesting and they say it did it did tell me a lot I didn't know and I, it also struck me that the when you described the structure of the textiles which again I didn't know it made me think of the the counter quilting that they do in Bengal um, more than the kind of American style quilting it seems to have that element to it um, but that's enough of my inexpert observations um, Jennifer, would you like to talk to us about the work you've been doing? Sure. Um, so specifically to do with the pieces that are Lorena Balwa inspired, I have two pieces that I have produced during residency. Let me share my screen. I might say while Jennifer's doing that, that Jennifer has been a writer in residence um, at the National Centre for Writing um, and that was uh, part of the project that she did during that residency. So the first work was um, produced, it's a blackout poem, which is when you uh, redact text uh, in order to kind of find a poem inside a larger text which may not have anything to do with the original text. And the blackout poem that I, the blackout work that I did was on a transcript very kindly provided by Ruth. Uh, the transcript is called 2014-291. And just now Ruth was talking about the size of these works. Um, this, just this small section of the transcript in real life measures to 1.5 meters. Um, and I still haven't finished it, which is why in the picture you can see a, a little unfinished end of it bunched up over there. Um, I'm going to read what exactly has been blacked out directly from the, uh, from the piece of textile that I've done. Uh, to the banker. To the banker, I never had a farthing. I am a true loyalist. I hate women. What I have, I would not touch with a fork. 
Now I have done the inside. I miss the outside. To hear it jingle, to hear it roll like gold, left to someone else by will. I married the carpenter's daughter and cathedral at the same time. Bought an album of Welsh views. Lodged a fancy. Saturday night stayed until Monday morning. Death came down to Crown Road to see if it was true. He's perspired so much. Maria Esther told us she could wring his shirt. Had a doctor been sent for in time, he would have been alive. Maria Esther's tricks. Woman, the same woman, dressed in man's clothing. Send me a bright scarlet shawl, harlot. I know both sides of the question. The name. Of the father as music and theater prompt, how the depth of the river came from a wish to be nearer to scandal. I read it in the newspaper. I read it in the news, and I often wonder. I, Miss Lorena Balwa, wonder if my mother was surprised, a trick, and I can see through it now. For years to come. You told mother and I to kiss the back of my hand, turn double jointed, for the purpose of defying every law in England. I left anarchists, nihilists, traitors, bad coins, and metal makers, poor as a church mouse. Mouse, when the dead fly over the river, this is their saying between their teeth: Molly coddle, Polly coddle. Western Molly Coddle Polly Coddle, the truth is this: What have I, Miss Lorena Balwa, to do with the above? I have not a farthing. Lovely. So that is the, th thank you. That is the whole one point five meter piece, and like Ruth was saying, this was a, uh, Lorena was a very complex woman, and I was very.、Um, Anxious when dealing with the textile, of not wanting to misrepresent her, but at the same time recognizing that as a reader of the text, I will always be bringing my own meaning to it. When I read the text, my eyes wandered a lot just because it was so voluminous, and、um, I wanted not so much to make sense of what she was saying, but to play. Because there were so many bits of phrase that, to me, were really imaginative and surprising, which is、um, what we we aim for, what we look for in in poetry.、Um, I also was wondering towards the beginning、uh, whether or not to keep certain words, because I don't I don't know the intention、um, from which. They are being said, both in terms of spatially, my my place in time versus hers, and culturally. Like there is a statement towards the very beginning where she says, "I hate women," and I spent a full two or three days thinking, should I black this out or not? I don't think she was misogynistic. I think she just really was very angry about the women in her life. But then, even then, I might be wrong. I don't know. Uh, my, I was very happy with this transcript to be able to fit in the last bit of line, which states,、uh, "I miss Lorena Balwa. Have nothing to do with this text,"、um, because that was very important to kind of somehow acknowledge. This is not. These are her words, but they are not her words. I am deliberately、uh, playing with them.、Uh, Separately from working directly with her work, I also produce my own letter,、um, much less voluminous because、um, I don't I don't think I have the stamina <laughs> that she did.、Um, and this is a poem about the state of the world around me. It is a little bit of a complaint, but it is also just.、Um, A sort of letter that is meant to provide 
I don't know if the word is hope or comfort, but just something in, in some very troubled times that are happening around me, uh, both personally and socially in Singapore. And this particular, the imagery here is a rumination on our national flag, which is a crescent moon and five stars. I wasn't able to fit the whole poem in this letter, but I will read out the whole text. To the idealists, it's always about the raindrop, not the storm. The one sad story, not the long arm of history. A surface made threadbare, a clouded eye, a sadness with no reckoning. All your life you faced a hoisted moon and their ideals as stars so tiny you cannot make them out. All your life, hand over heart to this painted crescent, moon love still, love to stillness. All your life is precious, even when they say it is not. They blame your light, your shadow, your tone, the thunder. But look at her. Not the portrait they made and can never raise high enough to reach her heights. How she comes and goes and becomes again this pulse in our sky, teasing out time they say we must never let finger off the trigger. And yet what if we let it bloom? All your life you hold your breath, your words, your comebacks come back before you retreat so far into yourself you cannot answer why you love this country. Look at her, how she addresses us, naked as a bomb's heartbeat. Just beautiful. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Um, it was really um, interesting to see the two different ways in which you've connected with Lorena, first of all, directly through that text. I wonder if I could ask you, um, what inspired you to choose that of all the texts that you could have um, performed the, 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 the blackout poetry maneuver it, it was on? Very, it was very practical. It was the longest transcript that I received. <laughs> okay, and so I had enough. the most amount of words. Uh, and, and you always want more with a blackout to, to then kind of carve the little bits mm. that uh, you find interesting. Mm -hmm. I think you did a, you did a fabulous job with it. The, the, it made me wonder, following on um, the very um, interesting things that Ruth said about the reasons why we might have these texts of Lorena's because they were stitched. Um, and it made me wonder whether or how you think your work with her text might have changed had you been able to be in Norwich for your residency and to have seen the texts in the flesh, as it were? I think I would have probably not done it because I would have been so in awe that I would just have given up. Um, you know, when you see stowing in in the flesh and you and you 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 appreciate how much work has gone into it um even with stitching my own letter just the time it took to get every single word out um definitely Ruth is right you you do want to choose uh, all caps even though it seems quite shouty just for clarity um yeah I, I really don't know what would have happened if I'd seen it in real life. I, I really don't. I really hope that some stage you will be able to come to Norwich and see them in real life when when I, we I are a little to. freer than we are now. Um, thank you so much, Jennifer. sally Ann, would you like to talk to us about the work that you've done, please? Yes. Um, thank you, Jennifer. That was fascinating. I was just interested. Had you stitched over? Was your redaction a stitched redaction? No, because when I tried on a on in my first attempts, I did a stitched one, and it just took so much time. So I resorted to wool because it's a bit thicker to kind of just stitch the wool over what was already printed. I even tried to actually stitch uh, to restitch Lorena's sampler, little bits of it, and it was just uh so so much patience, so much um dedication and confidence you need to have in those words to be able to put the time, invest the time into 
uh, transferring them on fabric. I really appreciated that in doing this. So, um, well, I I run a thank you thank you Jennifer. I run a um, a health and well being project called um, the Cloth of Kindness, which was inspired by the writings of Julian of Norwich and the embroideries of um, Lorena Bulmer. So I made the first cloth of kindness for an exhibition um, about Julian of Norwich called Compassion and Creativity. Um, and I was inspired by Julian's phrase, enfolded in love. Um, so I asked people to send me in um, their thoughts and experiences of kindness and compassion. And then I sewed the, and I asked them to send in also special pieces of fabric that meant something to them. Um, somebody's mother's, their, their, their departed mother's um, scarf or a daughter's ball gown. Anyway, pieces of fabric invested with, with something emotional. Um, and then I stitched in the style of Lorena um, people's words. So um, this is kind of the cloth of kindness and it was made in soft fabric. So I used the capital letters like Lorena um, and the idea was that it was exhibited so that you could literally get underneath it and be enfolded in love. Um, and I, um, I wanted to turn um, Lorena's kind of rage and unhappiness into a, ki a rant of kindness. So um, just to read a tiny little bit from it, um, compassion is kindness in the presence of suffering. On the morning my dad died, she came early and sat with us in the silent living room outside the birds were singing. So it's a stream of consciousness of different people's um, experiences of compassion and kindness. So this, um, this was exhibited um, and then after that um, we were invited to go to the Norfolk and Norwich Hospital um, and make another cloth of kindness. But this time um, we worked with lots of different people. So um, patches were sewn by nurses, doctors, volunteers, visitors, patients, and all sewn together in, into one cloth of kindness. Um, and since then, we've now made 12 different cloths of kindness working with different people, um, each person sewing their own little patch. Um, and I always say behind every patch lies a story. And we've made a little film which I'd like to show you so that you can hear some of the people's um, stories that have been inspired by Lorena. <laughs> patch. It says all you need is love. Uh, mine was inspired by my cancer journey from where it started. My um, partner who I'd only actually been with for four weeks before I got diagnosed decided to stick with me through my whole journey and just showed me unconditional love which I didn't, I'd never experienced before and he got me through it, so yeah, that's why I think all you need is love, is where that's come from, because that's what got me through everything. Hi, my name's Edie, and this is my patch. It says, the kindness of a stranger healed my anger and showed me the power of herbal tea. And it's from a time where I was really struggling with my mental health, and I was crying in the city centre of Norwich, and a lady came and she took me around her house and we drank herbal tea and um, just talked for ages until I calmed down and now whenever I'm stressed I'll have a cup of herbal tea. Hello, my name's Dorothy. I have written on here, winter always turns into spring and the reason why I chose that is one of my favourite sayings from my Buddhist philosophy because it means that no matter how unhappy you are, if you can keep positive, uh, it can turn into joy. And of course, it is like nature. Winter always turns into spring. It never, never goes back to autumn or anything else. And I just think it's a lovely saying, and I just love it, and it's my favourite. This I have printed for my family. This is my heart, and this is my 
my special persons in my heart. This is for my patients I'm looking after in Ward 12. And this is my favorite God. What defines you is your determination when you have nothing and your attitude when you have everything. That's, your, that's my favorite quote. Hi, my name is Chris Andrews. The reason I did a smiling emoji with keep smiling is I think whatever your downfall and however your day, smile and it will make things better. My name is Grace and I'm writing Pickle. Um, because one of my friends gave me a rabbit, which I named Pickle, as I've been struggling with my mental health. Acceptance of yourself is far more important than acceptance from others. Deep in their roots, all flowers keep the light. My name is Helen. When you hold my hand and hold my gaze, I feel safe, even when I hurt and feel afraid. And I do get frightened. Um, I'm also very hard of hearing. Uh, so for me, when someone gives me attention, um, I like it if they will hold my gaze rather than just sort of looking in the other direction. My name's Mel. My patch says a dream is a wish your heart makes because I was lucky enough to get the funding to go to Disneyland Paris in 2016 with my family. So uh, I think that gives you a sense of some of the stories behind the patches and how just a very simple saying, which may not seem to mean very much when you understand the history behind it, um, has a lot of po poignancy. Um, and we always say that uh, it, it's together that we make something beautiful and it, it doesn't matter about the quality of the stitching. Um, everybody can join in. Uh, we, we do get some fantastically embroidered pieces, but we also get some where people have really struggled and those are often the ones that break my heart. Yeah. Thanks ever so much, Sally, and it's a lovely project. Um, and um, while I was watching it, I was reflecting on um, what it is about needlework that makes it somehow very permanent and very therapeutic in a way that I, I'm not sure writing is. I don't know if anybody would like to make a comment on that because um, all of you do both. I, I'm struck by how important legacy is to all the people that we work with. In every case we leave a cloth of kindness behind in the institution and it may be an institution which people are passing through either because they're dying or because they're going to health or m m getting better um, but it's very important to them to leave a legacy behind for the people that come after and, and it seems to me that Lorena left us a legacy and, and that's something that the stitched word um, does more because as as, as Ruth said or, or, or maybe it was Jennifer you know you could throw away paper but actually yeah. you hold on to the preciousness yeah and it it's a sort of generally a more robust form thanks ever so much um Mariko would you like to talk to us about about your work so um back in the summer of 2016 I believe um I received a fellowship for a month in Norwich um Back then, it was still Norwich uh, Writers' Center. Um, now it's National Writers' Center. Um, but anyways, so um, initially, I was interested in, in Julian and Norwich. And of course, Julian and Norwich is sort of the titan, titan the historical titan of Norwich. Um, so I spent many days walking out, out along the wall, um, and Julian was walled in. So this idea of walls, Julian, and... Um, Serendipitously, serendipitously um, when I mentioned about Julian to Kate, she said, oh, um, do you know George? I was like, oh, yeah, George Sturgis, of course. So George was kind enough to invite me to lunch. And when, I, when we were discussing about things, um, 
he introduced me to Sally, and so Sally Ann came along, and we were, you know, it was, it was just a pleasant afternoon um, lunch, and um, we started talking, and then she said, do you know Lorena Bulwer? And um, so this is sort of nodding towards Sally Ann, um, and of course, you know, Lorena was walled in, so there was a sort of theme of walls um, that reappeared again, um, and it's, it's all these sort of breadcrumbs of ideas where you have um, Marina, I went to visit the Norwich um, Museum archive, saw the tapestry, examined her syntax, um, overwhelmed by her syntax. Um, and then um, as I was writing during the residency, I also knitted quite a bit because it's my ways of, uh, sort of taking a pause from writing and, and just let my hands move so my mind can wander around and of course Julian was a spinner so all of these sort of collided and um, I came out of a three a four week residency um, writing about Julian um, and then starting another piece but Lorena was sort of somewhere in the back of my mind um, and then um, so as I was doing research about textiles and women and women's work um, Elvis Parker came up and uh, for those of you who are familiar with her work, she, she's an embroiderer as well, 19th century, um, early 20th century. And her piece, her tapest well, her embroidery is um, at the Cloth Workers in the Joyce Albert archive. So I went to see it and it was, it's basically a tapestry. Well, it's, it's a very, you know, I keep calling it tapestry, but it's actually an embroidery, a text over, over it's a memoir, confession about being violated by her master while she was working as a maid. Um, and all of those sort of things kind of percolated in my head. And, um, but as, as any project goes, you're not quite sure what you're working on. Um, so it took me to, when I was in Hawaii doing uh, research about Japanese American uh, plantation workers, I looked at cloth and the kimonos, or actually recycled kimonos that they brought from Japan, and then they became field, um, so field clothes, and also um, Hawaiian shirt is based on Japanese American plantation workers recycling um, silk kimonos into Hawaiian shirts, um, on and on and on, and you know, of course, and I think in any project you're working on. Um, you sort of have to live your life. And while I'm thinking about these things, um, I'm also dealing with my mother's uh, dying and death and cleaning houses, um, after, or cleaning the house after she, left, after she died. And I don't know, she, she's one of those people who are borderline hoarder. Um, I think it has something to do with 1950s, growing up in 1950s, 1950s Japan, the economic miracle, uh, consumerism, materialism, aspiring middle class, all of that um, just made her into this. Basically, she, she left behind everything. So I can actually trace a 50-year-old uh, handbag she left in a box. Um, and I can find her photos carrying that, that handbag. Uh, kimonos. Um, she also was working for a kimono company. So I think she bought these kimonos. Um, many of, I, I think there was about 80 of them. Um, many of them w was never worn. Um, so on and on and on. And of course, I think while we're dealing with that, we have different manifestations of grief. Uh, my manifestation of grief was basically cleaning the house and a lot of uh, undoing kimonos to make into something else. My uh, a relative had a nervous breakdown and the way how she writes email, um, always at one o'clock in the morning, is exactly the same way that Lorena Bowler wrote. Um, all capital letters, repetitions, uh, storytelling that's fantastical. Um, and in Lorena's piece, there's um, a phrase that keeps appearing, I miss, Lorena Bulwark, and um, because she doesn't use punctuation, it's I, I literally I, I think she meant I comma Miss Lorena Bulwark. So she's referring to her as, as a subject and also a third person. Um, but my relatives who's having a nervous breakdown is 
you know, doing the sort of same thing as well, the sort of lack of punctuation, um, restlessness, um, aggressive capitals. And so while I'm working through you know, cleaning the house and dealing with my relatives and all of that, um, Maureen is coming back again. And um, so it's, I don't know where the project is taking me, but for the last four or five years, I think Lorraine and Bulwer has had a profound impact on my, I wouldn't call it a journey, because journey makes it sound so epic. And so, you know, it's, there's a hero, because I'm not a hero. Um, but it, I guess a chapter, maybe, a, a journey that I'm going on, um, where everything's sort of colliding and echoing from the past. Maureen's syntax is coming back as the present day email of someone who's having a nervous breakdown. Um, Elizabeth Parker's embroidery is coming back as sort of a confessional that I'm writing right now, which I'm not even sure what I'm confessing. Um, that the fact that I, I love my mother, but I also hate it um, that she's a hoarder um, with secrets. Um, I'm also sort of dealing with, um, you know, this. Uh, and I think that sort of prejudice that we carry, which is abundant in Lorena Walner's um, text, um, that keeps surfacing again and again. So it's, it's still going, but it's not. I'm not sure what it is I'm writing about. I'm not sure what I'm exploring. Um, all I know is that somewhere, always, I'm going back to Lorena Walner. It, it it sounds as though um, you, you're in a sort of very deeply creative place with all this, Mariko. Um, I'm uh, I, I marvel at the um, at this collection of quilts and kimonos that you've been confronted with uh, whilst drawing a conclusion to your mother's life. Um, what an extraordinary what an extraordinary treasure to have, but also what a difficult task. To, to have to undertake. Um, but it made me think about um, needlework in a sort of historic sense and, and, and fabric. Um, is, is, one of, is one of the things that fascinates us, perhaps, the fact that, that needleworking goes back much further than writing? Is it that we use it as writers, do we use it to access something more atavistic and deeper than we can access merely by writing words? I think there's a there's a common root, isn't there, of um, text and, and textile. Yes. And that idea of weaving a narrative and telling stories through textiles is is incredibly powerful. Yes. Um, and it's it's you you do get such a sense of a person and a person's life um, and an, an identity. And it does. I mean, obviously, working with so many um, his, historic textiles, um, you know, you you do kind of get this 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 feeling of a person's life. We know how long it would take and how difficult we would find it to create something um, and so we have this this real kind of respect uh, for for the hours that have actually got gone into it but I was just really struck by what uh, Mariko was saying about um, the therapeutic benefits and I could see Sally sort of nodding along with that um, and you know when you're um, carrying out some kind of handiwork and, and and actually working with your hands it's a mindfulness practice you can't be anywhere else but where you are and what you're doing so it really brings you back in into a sense of yourself um, and it, it's also something that as you're you're doing it it was easier to speak to people when you're not looking them in the eye so you've got your hands um, you know looking down at your your hands you're not making eye contact you can say things that um, you you without fear of judgment in the same way so it's a really kind of it's a, it's a very different sort of process and I you know I was struck by you know Marika talking about the Elizabeth Parker sampler and we borrowed that to have it along Alongside Lorena for an exhibition a few years ago, and this incredible sort of testimony, um, and using it as as a, a way of expressing what really fascinates me about them is how how would Lorena or Elizabeth Parker have felt knowing that other people were reading their words? And I just was interested to hear what you might might think about that because I'm not sure how much how much privacy there was there, and how they would feel about us talking about it today. 
I don't know. It's a good question. Jennifer, do you have any thoughts on that, given that you've been, been working so closely with, with Lorena's that own is, texts recently? That is, that is definitely a question I have wondered about. Like, would the way that Lorena expressed herself have been different if she knew that... Because although she did address these two very specific people, there is a difference between writing something really angry and writing something really angrily that you know this other person will eventually receive. And I think she held on to that rage in a way, possibly knowing that there was also a futility to it. And that breaks my heart a little bit. Mm. That That is what I, I, I do think happened with her work. Um, yes, sorry, I lost my train of thought. That's fine. Um, I was very moved by what Ruth said about um, the element, not just what she embroidered, but how she was doing it, stabbing the needle through all those layers of fabric. And to what extent that was also a way of... Um, dealing with her with her rage and 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 unstoppering the repression of her anger and, and she's constantly like asserting herself are you saying about you know she's always saying i miss lorena Bora, and i i too have that that feeling that she has lost an identity and in going into an institution like a workhouse you do lose your independence and a lot of what she's actually writing about and stitching is wanting to kind of get back to her property and to to sort of have her rights um actually uh, seen to and, and address so she is you know she, this is her, her her getting across the fact that I'm an individual and I demand to be heard um, and she's using the textile to actually do that so it's, it's really interesting in the way it sort of turns the idea of women's work on its head as being something passive this is an incredibly active kind of um, you know creation that she's doing she's really you know they, they, this you know 12 foot long it also you can see how beneficial it was to her too um, to carry on doing it Yes, yes. It's it, it, it's interesting. Um, I, I think um, because I, I was thinking when when Sally Ann was speaking, um, the the cloth of kindness. There is a great uh, positivity to those, and most of your contributing embroiderers have expressed positive sentiments, um, even in very difficult circumstances. Um, but it seems that the needlework is always bound up one way or another with quite intense emotion. And I think it's quite interesting. I, I was thinking about how you juxtapose it with, and I suppose this is, 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 is partly um, my interest, with needlework as mass production. How, how does the kind of thing we've been talking about juxtapose with needlework, predominantly women's work, done in factory settings as some kind of mass production? Well, the answer is, I think that to be able to do it at home, you know, when I'm sewing, I do think about the many different kinds of people who are doing needlework and the conditions they're in. Mm. And I'm, I'm not so much always, uh, uh, thinking about my centeredness as much as how privileged I am to actually have the time and the space to do it and in an art context as well. Um, I think everyone who has ever done needlecraft does have their thoughts wander towards this. I was reading um, the poetry collection of Anne Boyer, which I think was done in 2016, called Garments Against Women. And it very much goes into detail how many uh, hours are spent on the work. How much is a person who is not me, who is making the clothes of the world being paid to do this. Um, and the weight of, of knowing that, and you're still sitting there stitching and, and not, swearing, not knowing if what you're doing will have any impact on the world. Uh, I don't. I don't know if I have an answer to that, but I think I'm very heartened to know that I. There is a community of us who who have returned to sewing when we don't feel like we can write. Um, yeah. 
may I say something about, um, yeah, thank you. Um, I just wanted to, to respond to that whole notion of, of the kindness and the time and space and that, what a gift that is. And I think, you know, although I listen to Lorena's um, anger and, and, and her, you know, assertion of her rights, it's also, um, I do reflect on the fact that she is being given materials, time, space, access to scissors and needle in, in a lunatic ward um, in a workhouse to to create that work and I think that is you know something that I, I remember when Sally and Anne and I met that was something we reflected on is that, that actually somebody is being kind to her and realizing how beneficial this is to her state of mind um, and enabling her to carry on and, and I think it kind of comes in again with this idea of um, the hours it takes to, to do and how much more uh, meaningful a gift is that somebody has made you and and because you can sense the hours and the love that's been sort of put into it and I think that's why you know I, I really love seeing um, Jennifer's work with you know the, the actual index of having the entire thing there and then spending time framing everything is, is incredible and I, I just think she would have been delighted to see everybody responding in this way to her work well, uh, well yes one would like to hope so she might have uh, she might have been absolutely furious and embroidered further <laughs> <laughs> and, and added a few more names to her list <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> And I, I just was... say at the end, she has nothing to do with it, <laughs> using her own words. So. <laughs> Sorry, Sally Ann, were you going to say something? I was just going to say that when I was making the original Cloth of Kindness, where I did all the sewing myself in the style of Lorena, um, it took me four weeks of eight 12-hour days to, to <gasps> do it for the deadline. But, you know, it was one of the happiest times of my life and an incredibly reflective um, time of, of great depth and meditative quality. And it really made me realise, though I hadn't realised this before, that my own mother had a lot of mental health issues and sewing was one of the few things we could do together. And I hadn't realised that that was so much part of the concept of, mm. of, of the Cloth of Kindness. It was in, and in fact, I had been with my mother to see Ruth's exhibition, um, Textiles from the Edge, because my mother had found sewing incredibly helpful for her mm. mental health. So I took her to that exhibition where we saw together the Lorena thing. So it's funny, it now meets up with um, Mariko. Um, you know, my mother makes quilts, which are heritage pieces, which I love. Um, you know, so there is something about this, this passing on. Um, and I like to feel that, you know, that Lorena has inspired this whole project uh, going into institutions that, you know, and that, her, her work is, is going on inspiring, helping people hundreds of years later. Um, and, um, and just to sort of say, when we were working with the teenage mental health unit, um, we had to count in the needles, count in the scissors and count them out. And on one occasion, three needles went missing and we were there for four hours. Um, <laughs> while everybody came in, they closed down the place. You know, it was, it was quite serious while they- um, Yeah. And they had to find what had happened to the needles to protect the young girls and, and what indeed one young girl had taken them but um they still were prepared to do that and they didn't they didn't send us away afterwards they they they, they let us come back again so that that matches up with the idea that Lorena you know must have had support to to, to do that because it's, mm. it's not easy bringing these things into into the kinds of um institutions yeah. where they can be threatening it, it also brings to um, it brings to the fore that kind of thing. I, I, I think that the, the physicality of needlework, um, and I think that this is something that we quite easily forget as writers now because most of us work on screens. Um, but uh, it's something that is I've been thinking about while everybody's been talking also is about maybe there is a much closer comparison between needlework and writing by hand which is physical and does the same thing to the body. It contorts you into funny positions and, you know, pens can, we've all got these, any of us who write have got these bent fingers, you know, <laughs> holding <Yeah>. pens. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and I just, I just wonder if, if the, if the process of handwriting is actually much more visceral and less intellectual than writing on a keyboard and whether that is, a closer relationship to the needlework. 
I, I write all my first drafts um, by pen, by hand, for precisely that reason. And in, in the same way that I love hand sewing, but I, I don't like machine sewing at all. So for me, the hand aspect of it is, is, is vital. Mm. That's interesting. I, I think I'm, I'm sure your brain works in a completely different way when you do things by hand. Uh, sorry, Jennifer, I, I, I think with... I talked across you. Oh, sure. No, I agree with Sally that uh, it's definitely very much about the, the motion of doing it, the hand, but aesthetically, whatever comes out, the visualness of my own handwriting, I hate it <laughs> so much. Um, needlework to me appeals to me more because there's something about that thread which allows me to shape it, which makes me feel more comfortable and, and, and happier. So in many ways, I actually prefer sewing to writing. I, I think someone was saying just now they, they, they take a break from writing to sew. I take a break from sewing to, uh, my break is writing from the sewing at this point. Because it makes me so happy textile wise. Uh, it's definitely true that that working on textiles does give you joy. One of the things that I wanted to say was about you know, Ruth, you talked about the way we when we're sewing we don't look at each other and that certainly facilitates so so with the cloth of kindness we get small groups of people sewing together. Um, and, and and it does facilitate very deep conversation. So sometimes we sew in silence, but sometimes people talk. And um, and often people will talk about things that they may never have talked about before. So I, 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 we had one situation in, in a, um, one of the hospitals we were working in, where a, a member of staff who, who came from Nigeria originally, um, she came to the group several times, sat quietly sewing, and, and there was a sense of her being pregnant with story, with something to say. Um, and then she told us an absolutely horrific thing that had happened to her in her early life, which she had never told anybody at all. Um, and then she stopped coming to the group. And her pieces are simple, optimistic sayings, but clearly the process, she wanted to share that story. Um, in, and that felt like a safe holding context for her to be able to share a very traumatic story. Um, so I, I don't quite know what that's about really, but about the fact that we've, we've been gifted with these amazing stories that, that don't necessarily show in the text, but which definitely lie behind the process. Do, do we think that there is um, a safety for us personally in um confiding some of our creativity to needlework rather than to words or using it as a as a channel in the way that your uh nigerian participant did there is something i think that you can hide in more when you do visual work aesthetic work than with words so like the moon piece that I've done, the original Which image for it actually, oh, thank you. The original hand actually has a, a baby's face resting in it. And when my mother asked me why it, the image was that way and I had to put the story in words, it upset her so much that she told me, you have to change it and you can never let anyone see this image ever again. Oh. The, the image itself is beautiful and I have revised it for this poem, but it's, it's because it's not literal, it can be appreciated and it can also be appreciated much quicker than words can because we are, uh, most of us able people are very visual people at first. Yeah. Um, so I think you're definitely right that there is a safety in the visual, which I don't know, maybe I'm in the wrong art form now, I'm thinking, <laughs> if I want to tell scary stories, but um, I, I like both. There's no um, rule that says you have to be in one or the other. Mm. I mean, I think yes. everybody here, well, with the possible exception of me, is working in in, in different, you know, in, in, in ekphrastic ways and sort of multimedia ways. So I don't think you, I don't think you have to do one or the other. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, m- moving on to the visual, um, obviously we've we've come to this through Lorena and her embroidering of words, but what is it we're looking at? We, we've, you know, we've, we've looked at the words and, and Jennifer has clearly made a very close study of some of those words to produce the blackout poem. Um, and we've attributed meaning to those words. But if we go back to this, and it really did arrest me, this image of her sort of stabbing the needle hard through the fabric. What is it we're really reading in a piece of embroidery? Um, I, I think it was interesting hearing what Jennifer had, had to say about um, about hiding, but it's also you're becoming part of a community as well. There's a lot of nuanced extra message that comes with choosing that medium you are consciously putting yourself into a community of you know it's mostly women there are obviously some amazing male stitchers as well but you are um, talking also about women's work you are t- t- talking about domesticity you're talking about nurturing roles as well so that you you bring a lot more to, to of, of those narratives and stories just automatically with your choice of medium you're sort of already doing something um that gets you know it shortcuts straight into our collective kind of understanding, our communal understanding of what textiles kind of mean. It'd be really interesting to know, actually, I don't know if this is one um, that you know the answer to, Mariko, but um, I'm aware that we've got uh, a panel from uh, uh, different cultural backgrounds here. Um, and um, I became aware, and I was very surprised when I was researching, researching my first novel, which is about the Bayer Tapestry. Um, I was surprised to discover that actually it was probably mostly made by men and um, the the history of embroidery has changed over the years and become domesticated for various reasons. I wonder if um, Mariko in Japanese culture has it has embroidery always been something associated with women or is it something which is or has been associated with men as well? Right so because I'm in my office right now I can actually show this. Um, so, um, embroidery is still a strange craft, isn't it? Because it's about it's a it's an idea of recycling and um, rejuvenating a textile that may be frayed or that may be dying. So, what embroidery does is that it patches up holes. Um, it also patches. It, it adorns, um, it beautifies. And I think in sort of the everyday woman's life or everyday life, um, and I don't want to gender just yet, um, in everyday life, embroidery is used as a way to sort of elongate the life of the material. Um, so and it's often d- done by women. But when it becomes commercialized or when it's merchandised oftentimes the best embroiderer in japan are men um and i sort of want to bring up um this um sort of uh i guess collection that i have um this is called sending buddy um and this was made during the war times so whether it's a uh, russo japanese war whether it's um world war one world war two um that's the last war that japan technically fought um but what it what it is is basically this this one this happens to be um silk but it's basically thousand knots or stitches that are done by women and um, oftentimes women girls will stand on the street and they'll ask a woman to stitch one uh, one knot and um, it's, it's thousand because there's a saying in Chinese that says, uh, tigers will come back, uh, tigers will travel 1,000 li and come back 1,000 li. And um, so what that means is that, um, you know, here they are, uh, this is in nationalist of Japan, militarist of Japan, where um, men are supposed to die for the country and they're proud to die for the country, but women are making these sort of subversive stitches um, what they can't say in public, they're saying in, in private. Uh, mean, so what they're saying is come back alive. Um, so this is completely opposite from what their public persona is about. And it was actually um, encouraged by the government. So there's a contradiction that these women were navigating between the public um, discourse 
and the the private sentiment. And um, so I have about I don't know this is the one that died with um, ukong. It's that's a Chinese um, root medicine, um, and it's still used to ward off illness. Um, and uh, this one is no taste of green, but still has thousand stitches as well. Um, and of course, I have a very, very complicated relationship with this because um, these are very intimate objects. Uh, a lot of them have names um, of the soldiers. Um, it, I bought them on Yahoo Auction or eBay, which is a commodification of um, war goods, right? And that's, it creates so much complicated layers. I'm a consumer consuming something that's very private. Um, but I, I found this very fascinating because um, because and here they are, these women are using their craft to make an anti-war sentiment um, that that was prohibited and often seen as um, fusionist during wartime. And so these are sort of domestic language that's spoken. Um, and um, and like I said, it was encouraged by the government. So it was considered as a a good woman's work, right? But then at the same time, the message it carries is um, quite subversive. And um, I, like I said earlier, and I'm an avid knitter, um, I find that when I get upset, I actually start embroidering. Um, all these sort of kimonos that I've unraveled, they have this sort of cotton cloth inside um, and I'm making rags out of them. And I embroider um, patterns on them. And it soothes me. And I think, and I think and this is um, a sort of a public sanctioned ways of calming down women, um, especially in the workhouse for Lorena Bulwer, right? Lorena Bulwer became a good woman. Oh, what's sort of seen as a good woman, um, someone who doesn't speak, someone who doesn't act out, only when she's doing embroidery. But the um, ironic part is what she was embroidering is quite subversive. But so it's it's complete opposite action going on. She's being she's acting out through the text that she's embroidering, but she's actually a good woman while she's um, working on her craft. Same thing with the singing buddy as well. Uh, it's a it's a government sanctioned craft. It was encouraged. Um, a, what a good woman did to um, send off their men to the war um, with these thousand stitches. But the message it contains is quite subversive and quite actually anti-government. Um, so, you know, I think it's, it's such an interesting contradiction that's at work here, what Lorena Bulwer is doing, what the singing buddy uh, is doing as well. Um, does it make us a good woman when we're embroidering? Because we're contributing to domestic and also in some cases public landscape. Um, but is it actually truly, I don't know, subversive really? Um, I like to think of embroidery and threads and all of that is um, it's an act of love, it's an act of self-expression, it's an act of Killing, if you're using silk, um, it's an act of um, farewell um, as well. Um, for example, in Japanese tradition, um, the a good daughter, which I'm not, but a good daughter should have sewn the last kimono um, of the dead, which I didn't. Um, but there's an irony there too. Here's an, a, a kimono, which is supposed to be worn by the dead, but it's also used only once. Um, yeah, I and mean, there's all this sort of more of a more of a question than anything else that I think comes up when we start talking about um, embroidery and what's known as woman's work. I I like um, the way that you talked about. Um, the sort of division of the means of production and the, the, the idea of the oversight by the men and the work being done by the women and the subversion that's possible in that 
in 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 that arena um it's very interesting about the um the embroideries done for the soldiers going away to war and the sort of secret messages in those um uh, which uh, it reminded me of something i read once about how um if you have couture clothes made for you personally sometimes little sort of codes and messages and things will be stitched into them because they're just yours and nobody else's which uh, me being frivolous and into fashion fascinated me um, it was really interesting i don't know is there is there um is there a tradition in singapore at all of male involvement in embroidery jennifer that you uh, know of yes there is actually uh so many of the the best Puranakan tailors to today are actually men. So the Puranakan way of embroidery, Puranakan people are of both Malay and Chinese descent. So culturally, they have an embroidery which is quite fine, almost needle painted and needle lace, um, and is a mixture of those two cultures. Mm -hmm. and, and like I said, most of the practitioners that are well known for doing this are, are male. But also embroidery here is very culturally diverse because we're racially culturally diverse. Uh, but it's also, a, we're losing a lot of these cultures, not because people don't sew anymore, um, but because of, uh, to some extent, colonialism. So most, most young people, our mothers and all that, would have known sewing basically from school, from the mission schools, from learning from the nuns how to do cross stitch and uh, more Western uh, types of sewing rather than the traditional edging of, uh, say, the baju kurung or of Chinese stitchery. Um, I don't know how I feel ab about that because, uh, to be honest, I think even then that a lot of cross stitch and, and uh, needle work also was introduced to young boys and young men in this way. So it's not been uh, gendered under uh, mission school systems, which is nice. Mm. Um, I actually asked a poll among a very big arts group in Singapore on Facebook, like how many of you sewed when you were young and what did you sew? And quite a number of men actually replied and said, I did cross stitch with my mother and I wanted to do my own thing. So I sewed a little caricature of a, my favorite video game, like Mario Brother. Mario oh, I Kart love that. In cross stitch. <laughs> that is fun. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah so you have that and then you have the traditional stuff, which is dying out. I'm, I quite I like that, that, that cross fertilization of needlework and computer games. I will then do um, a little wrap up and say thank you very much to Jennifer, Salian and Mariko for sharing um, your experiences of um, working in dialogue with Lorena and more broadly of the creative interface between embroidery and writing and Ruth in particular thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and expertise with us and your obvious great enthusiasm and love for Lorena um, and I'm sure we're all looking forward to a time when we can visit her work in person more easily than we'd have been able to in the past few months thank you very very much everybody thank you for your time and it's been lovely to see you all thank you thank you thank you